I had hoped to show you some pictures, and I think you probably deduced that we were having some technical difficulties up there, so we will do without. But once in a while, I may give you some visual descriptions. Um, one of the reasons why I feel uh, at home in the engineering school is that a lot of the students tell me, I'm a visual thinker, Mr. Norton. Don't give me too much to read. Uh, don't talk too much. And I instantly empathize with that because I'm a visual thinker too, and I thought that that was something everybody has to unlearn and you have to become verbal. And um, in the engineering school, I can be very visual. And technology normally lets me indulge that, but I'll be visually verbal or verbally visual to the extent possible. I wanted to open with a slide, and this, this was maybe the, the most important slide. And it was a slide um, that follows the 21st century tradition that you open a talk with a, a slide on the screen that states your goal. And it was going to be a slide up on the screen, and it was going to say uh, a phrase in Greek, and I can't say it. So I'm just going to ask you to imagine some capital Greek letters. And if you ever walked up Rugby Road and looked at the houses there, then your imagination will have all you need. And I don't think the words would have meant anything more to you than those letters that you'd see on the fraternities and sororities. Um, and those are the words that set the theme that I'm laying before you today. And they're words that students at this university encounter every day. And in my experience, none of them know what they mean. And I hope to enlighten you on what they mean. And I hope to set them before you as a standard that I think is a guide to uh, a worthy life. I should say also, I feel partly grossly incompetent advising people on the conduct of life because I'm not any great source of wisdom on these things. I noticed that one of the introducers referred to uh, me and Professor Ramazani as people who will impart wisdom to you. Professor Ramazani will have to carry that burden <laughs> because I don't impart wisdom to anybody, but once in a while I feel like I have the chance maybe to show somebody something that makes them want to go and discover for themselves um, wisdom in their own version of it. I was going to show also a uh, picture of me, age four, sitting on the front step of my house, sitting next to a prized plastic boat model, and it had on my face an expression that you don't need me to show you a picture to know what it is, because you've seen it on children who, most, for the most part, children under the age of six, who have this smile come to them so easily because there's something different about life before age six. And you continue to see people smiling throughout your life as you go along in life, but it's never quite as total, never quite as absolutely pure as the smile of a child from the time the child can first smile until about the age of six. And I wanted to show you that smile and I wanted to, to propose the possibility that that kind of happiness is still achievable. And you, less than achieving it, you can still let it come to you. Um, and when I explain why I was smiling that way in that picture and why that smile became rare thereafter, I'd say it's because it wasn't long after that moment that I sold my freedom to various idolatries mm -hmm. that were handed to me as superior to whatever judgment was growing within me at that time, and so superior that whatever judgment was growing in me at that time was stifled and lost for years. Um, and I want to, in my talk today, tell you how I've recovered at least some of that. And I'm, uh, when I tell you that, I'm really addressing myself. You see, this is a special moment for me. Um, not just because I'm speaking in the rotunda, which makes it feel extremely special, but also because all right now I've got about 85 students and they're all a remarkably uniform age group. They're all about 22 and they're all about to graduate. 
And I share in that because I just turned 22 as well. <laughs> I just turned 22 for the second time. And I feel like if I have anything to say of any value, it's because I can speak to the 22-year-old me of 1986, and I know I can tell him things that I could have benefited from hearing. And so there's a possibility I can say something today um, that will help. In 1912, RMS Titanic sank, which is a fact that's extremely well known today thanks to a 1997 blockbuster movie. And that means I can use the example and you all know what I mean. When that ship was sinking, you all know that it did not have enough lifeboats. And you know that that problem was compounded by the fact that many of those lifeboats were lowered down off the davits into the sea, half loaded or less with people. And you know that of the more than 2,200 people of all ages and all classes on that ship, only about 700 survived. And um, there's a picture made possible by late 20th century technology of a shoe lying on the abyssal plain of the North Atlantic that hasn't decayed because at that depth there's so little oxygen, so much pressure, and so little light that there's no organism to eat it. And somebody wore that shoe, and it was probably not a survivor. And that shoe calls to the people who were in the lifeboats and says to them, maybe, maybe it should have been me in that lifeboat and not you. And I imagine, and I feel sure I'm right, that at least for many hundreds of those 700 survivors, that that thought was a, a nightly terror that may ultimately at some point, perhaps after many years, have led to insight, because pain leads to insight, and pain-faced leads to insight, pain fled from leads to permanent misery. But for those who confronted that, I imagine maybe it had a life-transforming effect, and maybe these survivors lived in a way that made their occupancy of that limited space on a lifeboat fitting. And to you in this room, I'm telling you that you got onto that lifeboat, one of those lifeboats. In the world, according to the statistics that I can find, somewhere between 1 and 2 percent of the population will go to, is going to, or has gone to college. And you're in that category. You made it on the lifeboat, partly through your own efforts and in large part through the help of others. You made it onto the lifeboat. That's not to say that everybody who didn't get into college ha had a life that was the equivalent of drowning out because, of course, there's all kinds of enriching, worthy, wonderful lives that people make without the benefits of college. For most of them, it's a disadvantage, but they, many of them make it anyway. But college, for many people, becomes their chance to fulfill their capacities, to be creative, to share their discoveries with others, to go out and find things from some transcendent place and bring them back to show to others. And what a wonderful thing that is. And for many people who are in that other 98 to 99 percent, life consists of making socks for those people and of daring not to ask for a bathroom break for fear of being fired. And so I think that that fact calls upon you in college, and you have graduated from college, to think about why you're in or why you went, and whether that experience will have made good use of that limited raft capacity. Which should lead you to ask, why are you in college? Or why, why did you go to college? And we have some pat answers, including the fairly obvious, to learn. Uh, there's other pat answers that come quickly, like to get a good job. These are both, I think, worthy things. I think people are best judged by their actions and not by their words. And on that basis, you can see other motives for going to college, 
like to have one heck of a party where nobody's checking on when you come home at night and, and nobody's watching over your shoulder to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm not saying those things are wrong or out of place. Um, I'm saying, though, that there might be something else. Learning is allegedly the reason for going to college, and yet I don't really find that a very satisfactory answer because we can all accumulate facts and we can all be the same people we were when we started accumulating them. And the point of fact accumulation seems to be less and less clear because uh, while I, it used to be convenient for me to have lots of facts at my memory, I don't have to anymore. I just look it up on Wikipedia and it's there. So fact accumulation kind of learning doesn't seem to justify the expense and pain of college to me. People say learning enriches your life, and I don't buy it because, to me, learning impoverished my life. When I was that blissfully happy four-year-old sitting on the front step of my house with my plastic boat, one of the reasons I was blissfully happy is nobody told me about the Holocaust, nobody told me about slavery, nobody had told me about sexual abuse, nobody had told me about the Great Leap Forward or Stalin or child labor in factories, and not knowing any of those things made my life, I thought, I think in retrospect, relatively rich. And uh, learning can impoverish, and if it's just learning for learning's sake, I don't see the point of that um, either. Uh, I do think there might be places, I most definitely think there are places for learning in college, but I think it's for some some higher purpose, and uh, I'd like to talk about that with you a little bit. Before I continue further, I also wanted very much to show you a, a pair of pictures. Uh, and I, was, I thought of showing you them because of the premise of the last lecture. Anthony Lazaro um, gave you the premise of the last lecture series. And it is that, you know, what would you say if you were going to deliver your last lecture? Let's pretend, and it's a game of pretend, and you play it because maybe it's only when you're about to die that you'll have the courage to tell the truth, because at all other times, the truth is too dangerous. Well, I don't think of it as pretend. Um, I remember telling students in the summer of 2001 well, you know, the students said, okay, what are we going to do on Monday? So I said, if I live until Monday, we're going to do X. And they all laughed, and I thought, well, I really mean that. You know, I'm trying to remind you that, you know, you can't make these assumptions. And um, this was a wild idea to them in the summer of 2001, but a lot of them seemed to get it a lot better a few months later. But um, I wanted to show you a pair of pictures because it was something that maybe helped me take that perspective of being somebody who never knows if the, last, if the thing I'm saying is the last thing I'm saying. Because um, I was going to show you a picture of a classmate named Robin. And of her brother. Named, named Ricky. And uh, Robin and Ricky were in my elementary school. Robin was in my class, and Ricky was across the hall. And they were twins, twin brother and sister. And I don't remember Ricky very well because he was in the classroom across the hall. But I remember Ricky, I mean Robin, and uh, what I remember about Robin was that She's a bit older than me, which at that age seemed a lot older than me. And she seemed to me to be an example of somebody who, who was really living. And I didn't feel like I was living as entirely as she was, because she, didn't, she was never afraid to say whatever was on her mind. She was that kind of person. 
and she sat in the front of the class and she talked to the teacher like, she, like the teacher was another kid in the class. She was fearless and she was a tomboy. She loved football. She was talkative and prone to joking, including uh, jokes that were crossing the line of, of propriety for a, an 11 year old. And I admired her and envied her for this. And um, she sat right in front of me, so I saw her every day. And then one Monday, it was October the 30th, 1973, I'd just turned 10, she wasn't there. And my last memory of her was of that vibrant joke teller. And um, she and her twin brother, Ricky, were listening to transistor radios while they walked along the railroad tracks. And a train struck them both from behind. And they never heard it because of the radios. And they were killed instantly. And that desk remained empty in front of me af afterwards as a daily reminder that I could go at any minute, too. And that's how I saw it, because when I was younger than her, I played on railroad tracks, too. My parents didn't know it, but it seemed to be a way to demonstrate my fearlessness to people whose opinion of me mattered a great deal. People whose opinion of me was so important that when I was five and was riding my tricycle still and they teased me, I invited them out to the creek where I ceremoniously rolled it wheel first into the creek and abandoned it there to prove how strong I was. And then when we would play on the tracks and squeeze pennies uh, on the tracks, I would pretend I wasn't afraid that a train would come and believed that that was just timidity on my part. When uh, Robin and Ricky proved to me that it was very sensible and I was lucky and it was just luck and nothing more than luck. It was just a flip of the coin. And our school class walked from our classroom in the elementary school to the Baptist church where their funeral was and I didn't know, I wasn't ready for what happened. Uh, two steel caskets were wheeled in and although um, my mother had died when I was eight, I had never seen a casket knowing a body was in it. And to think that Robin and Ricky's bodies were in there was a transformative moment. And I'm not saying transformative in a bad way. It told me something about the truth of life. And the truth of life when it first comes to you is painful and traumatic. But if you don't flee from it, it's enlightening, too. And so if I have one thing to tell to you, it's find the pain in your life and stop fleeing it and face it and see what it's trying to teach you. Because the most painful thing in your life is your best teacher. Um, Anthony, I'd appreciate it if you'd give me a cue when time is running out because I rehearsed with the pictures and that helped me know how far I was from the end. And so if you just say hold, that might mean five minutes, four, three, that kind of thing. Uh, that, that would be terrific, okay? Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to make a confession also, which is it seems to me that somebody might come to an occasion like this looking for advice about how to be successful. And I felt it would be dishonest of me to come here under those pretenses if somebody had that idea. And if you do, I say, go uh, take a little walk and come back when Professor Ramazani's ready to talk. <laughs> because I don't have any advice on success. To prove it, I was going to show you my ninth grade report card, which I do with students now and then, and they always seem to love it. And um, I guess they love it because it seems to break down barriers between teacher and student, and I, I enjoy it for that reason, too. So I'll just give you a quick walkthrough. I was going to show you a water-stained image of this carbon copy of a 
Fremont, California, Washington High School, ninth grade, fall semester 1978 report card. And I was going to walk you through the classes. The first is language arts. As uh, Eric Bradbury mentioned, I now have been, seem to become the undergraduate thesis person over in the engineering school where I'm constantly advising students to put their meanings clearly and scolding them verbally on the back about why don't, why don't they just say what they mean. Well, in uh, language arts with Mr. Gallagher, I got a C. Second class was ninth grade swimming. Sounds easy, it's harder than it sounds. <laughs> partly because it was 8.30 in the morning and it was an outdoor pool and it was cold. <laughs> and although the coach, Coach Springer, was dressed in a sweatsuit from head to toe with a knit cap on, he didn't seem to see any hypocrisy <laughs> in looking at a group of shivering, skinny 14-year-old boys and saying, get in that pool! And I informally gauged, as maybe my first scientific research endeavor, that the grade was proportional to the interval between getting that order and getting in the water. And on that grounds, I got a B. Third class on the report card was volleyball, which is harder than it looks, <laughs> OK? And I had Coach Springer for that, too. And he gave me a C plus in volleyball. And I can still hear him 30 years later saying, rotate, Norton, rotate, which was a concept that I always found difficult to put into practice. The fourth, general science, euphemism for science for idiots. I took that class from Mr. Zlotnik. Mr. Zlotnik gave me a B minus. That's the only grade in this report card I have any complaints about. It should have been a B. He had an extra credit assignment, which I did. It seemed to me, in retrospect, that I did a lot of extra credit assignments, but I skipped a lot of the required assignments, which probably doesn't make sense. Anyway, the extra credit assignment was make a sundial. And, don't, and to get the gnomon at the right angle, Look at the North Star at night. So I looked at the North Star at night. I uh, lined it all up. I sawed a sundial out of, out of plywood. I brought it to school. And that was one of those rare days when I was really smiling from the inside. And Mr. Zlotnik saw it. And he got out a sheet of paper. And he said, well, this extra credit assignment had to be in by December 1st. Mm -hmm. So I got no credit. It was something like December 5th. No credit for that. So uh, then after general science was basic algebra, which if I know this audience, if it's anything like the audiences I'm used to in the engineering school, basic algebra would be something that would give you no anxiety. But it gave me a lot. And so I'm very proud of the B that I earned in that class. And I tell students a B is a grade to be proud of. And they always give me this knowing smile, like, yeah, of course you're going to say that, Mr. Norton, yeah. Like, they don't believe me. And I wish I could show them the satisfaction that that B gave me in 1978. Admittedly, maybe there's been some great inflation since then. Uh, and what was the last, oh yes, the last class, French 2, A minus. I was so happy by that A minus. I must admit that I had the advantage of having a small crush on the teacher, <laughs> which motivates you powerfully. Uh, but I have had students come to me watery-eyed over A minuses, and I have never understood that to this day. I wanted to connect that report card to that picture of that smiling four-year-old with that beaming, perfect, totally undiluted smile and draw the connection, because something happened. The report card is harmless, but there's some, oh, I'm sorry. Intro to drama, D. <laughs> the engineers in this room have heard 
me talk about risk compensation, which is a theory. I'm telling you it's a fact. Risk compensation says that if you make something safer, users will take less responsibility to be safe, and therefore the risk will even out. If you make a class easier and you have a reputation for it being easy, the student will not try as hard. That's what happened. <laughs> uh, intro to drama. Um, anyway, yes, I was going to connect that report card to that smiling face because I, I have no objection to grades. I thought I did for a while, but I don't. Grades are a measurement. What happens is at some point, sometime probably pretty early in your life, somebody with your best interests in mind said, let's up the ante a little bit. Let's not make the grade just a measure of the work you did because it might take more than that to make you perform. Let's make that grade a sort of measure of you. And somebody did that for everybody in this room because that's, that's the way, way it is with grades. And when that happened, bad grades became terrifying. And that had happened to me. And so I, I lost that smile. But I think I've regained most of it since then. And it's because I've escaped, to some extent at least, report cards. And you could say, well, duh, you've been out of college now for 20 years. Well, no. Report cards continue. They just go by different names. There are performance reviews, promotions. If you go into academia, there are publications. If you have publications, you have reviews. And if you have an annual performance review with your department chair, your department chair will count, actually count your publications, right? And if you pursue other lines of life, the performance reviews continue. Did you get into a certain club? Did you pass a, a job interview? And if you didn't pass the job interview, does that mean that there was somebody else who was a better fit, or does it, that mean that you're worthless? Well, the answer depends on you, because the report cards, in all their various forms, continue. They'll continue throughout your life. And the question is, when will you rediscover what you unlearned? When will you rediscover that the report card is a measurement, not of you, but of something you did? and that everybody's done shoddy work. You couldn't have any excellent work if you didn't do shoddy work sometimes, because you can't do excellent work in everything. You have to pick. You gotta find what you're gonna be excellent in and not be upset that, okay, I can't play piano. It's the truth, by the way, I can't play piano and I don't care because I can do other things. And I can listen to people who can play the piano. I used to wish I could play the piano and one day I realized, I don't need to play it, other people play it. I can just listen, and isn't my life enriched by that? And I can do something else like playing the piano that enriches their lives. And we've all got something like that. And one of the surest ways to miss out on what it is, is to take these outwardly uh, empowered guidances to life that come from people who are willing to tell you that your performance reflects on your worth as a person. And when you can escape that, you'll discover something wonderful. And it's connected to that Greek statement um, I began with. Um, you can escape from your slavery to the approval of others. And here's where you all are a specially disadvantaged group. You hear the word disadvantaged and there's a certain image supposed to come to mind that doesn't include University of Virginia students sitting in the rotunda. But you are disadvantaged. You're disadvantaged because living as you are now, it's quite possible for you to have approval and live truthfully at the same time, and so you're not tested. The test will come, and to be honest, it has come in various forms to many of you in this room already, and I believe it will come to everybody who lives out your adulthood. A day will come, 
A day will come when you can be with truth or you can have approval. And if you're still enslaved the way I was enslaved to report cards, you'll choose approval. And at that day, you'll break with truth. And when you've broken with truth, you've lost that childish smile for good. You won't get it back. Because I've seen, I've met people who've made that break. And they still smile, but I never quite believe the smile anymore. And yet, there's plenty of adults who stay with truth regardless of the cost. And in that sense, some people that are officially called underprivileged have a great privilege because they've had the opportunity to face this test and to pass it. And when they faced that test and passed it, they made themselves free in a way that lots of PhDs never are. Because I can tell you, I'm speaking incidentally as one, that PhDs as a class don't impress me with their freedom. So how do you find that freedom? I'd like to take advantage of where we are right now. This is a very special building. It was built between 1822 and 1826, although to be honest, most of what you're looking at was put in in 1976. But this building itself was finished the year Jefferson died. And it was very carefully selected personally by Jefferson. I was going to show you his drawing, which you've probably seen, of the rotunda. Very carefully chosen. No other college or university had a rotunda. He chose a rotunda. And it seems to me that that's not an accident and that it's significant. Well, of course, there's some obvious things. It's got a circle cross section, and it's actually a sphere where the top and the bottom uh, are equidistant from the uh, sides here, the diameter. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of special, I guess. But it's also, it's a symbolic, it's symbolic of a structure that's been used all over the world for as long as we have recorded history for the search for truth, and that is a mountain. Like a mountain, the rotunda looks out equally from all sides, favoring none, unlike most buildings. And like a mountain, if you were to rise to the top, you would have a view unlike any on the ground. And incidentally, that window that you see directly over your head has got a name you might know. It's called an oculus, Latin for eye. And it's an eye that has a perspective unlike any other on grounds here because it's built on the highest ground on the top of the highest building. And you guys have all heard about mountains being places where people have pilgrimages. You know that Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And to bring them back down, to the people below, he went high to have a transformative moment, brought back truth as he saw it to his people down in the valley below. And this goes on all over the world. You see it in Japan, of course, at Mount Fuji. And I wish I could show you, but you guys can all see for yourselves thanks to Google Images. Just type in Hokusai and Fuji the man painted 36 views of Mount Fuji in one year. That was an act of pilgrimage in itself. And what's amazing about these pictures to me, so go look at them, please. Maybe you can bring some of them to mind, those of you who know what I mean. He's got one that's your classic Mount Fuji, you know. The rest are people going about their business, you know, carrying thatch to thatch roofs of houses with, fixing tiles on another roof. There's a barrel maker. And in all of these views, Mount Fuji is this tiny little triangle in the distance. And none of the people are paying attention to it. They're not looking at it. The man making the barrel is one that amazes me because you can see right through the open barrel. He hasn't put the ends on yet. And he's working inside it, scraping it out. And when you look through that barrel, you see this little Mount Fuji. And it's tiny. It's smaller than the bar barrel. It's lower down. And in his world, 
that barrel is so much bigger and more important than Mount Fuji. But of course, you turn that around, and from the point of view of somebody on Mount Fuji, he and his barrel are invisible. And if you take all of these particular perspectives of these people going about their work in Hokusai's paintings, each one has a perspective that's incommensurate with the other views. They're seeing Mount Fuji from a different side. They're seeing their little world from different angles. They aren't, um, their views aren't compatible. What they're seeing is not what other people are seeing. But then the last image is of pilgrims climbing Mount Fuji. And um, when you climb Mount Fuji, your motives matter. If you're climbing Mount Fuji, to tell your friends that you climbed Mount Fuji. Well, when it starts to get really hard and tiresome, maybe you'll turn around and just tell your friends that you climbed Mount Fuji. Or you've heard that climbing Mount Fuji is a way to see a new perspective. Maybe you'll just settle for what other people tell you that perspective is instead of discovering it for yourself and count on, rely on second-hand accounts. Well, if your motive is to be transformed, you'll keep on, you'll keep on going. Because when you get to the top, you'll see a perspective that will transform you. And that is everybody else's particular perspective. None of them the cheaper for it. All of them now magnified by their, the, re, the inner connection between them all that you have just revealed for the first time. So it seemed like they were all doing their separate little things and now you see that they're separate little things or pieces of something very big. And I would have shown you the picture that you'd see on the top of Mount Fuji in 2008, which is a sign in English and Japanese that says, you've made it, full of cute little things that the Japanese love so much, which trivializes it, of course. So by contrast, I was going to show you also something else that's up there. There are two of these pilgrims. And they're standing in the midst of a Tori gate, which is one of those sacred Japanese gates I'm sure you've seen in pictures, uh, Shinto gate, symbol of transformation. And when they look down at that world, they're looking at it through a Tori gate, showing that the mountain's significance is recognized. It's an outward symbol of an inner transformation. Some people forget the distinction, and you'll find people who imagine, for example, that their diploma from the University of Virginia is what gives them pride and honor and so on. And I've seen the little greeting cards and the things they say about this. Um, and you know what the ones I mean. But of course, that's getting it backwards. The diploma is the side effect of the transformation if, in fact, you ever really did undergo it. If you merely learned and ac accumulated facts and you weren't changed, then you're one of the people who decided to go back and just tell people that you climbed up Mount Fuji. This transformative mountaintop experience is something else that I'm going to actually ask you to see in another version. And thanks to electronics, you can all now go and see it this evening. Go to Google, type in. Martin Luther King and Mountaintop. And it's funny to me that his I Have a Dream speech is so well known, but this other speech is so much less well known. But it was April the 3rd, 1968. Martin Luther King traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to support sanitation workers in a sanitation strike. And before he arrived, the death threats started coming in at a record pace. He was used to them, but he was not used to getting them constantly by phone, by telegram, by uh, postal letter, by written, handwritten note, um, by shout. And they were coming in a torrent. And some of them were detailed and showed that these people were serious. And. Uh, Right then, Martin Luther King faced a choice. And the choice was, stay with truth or survive. And his choice is a moving one. He knowingly said, I'm going to stay with truth. And 
he said, maybe I should tell you what he said. He said, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. He was referencing Moses being on the mountaintop of Mount Nebo where he could see the promised land but could not get there. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to have a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so, listen, and so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And that's the last audio we have of Martin Luther King. You can't hear him say another thing anymore because within 18 hours of that statement, he was shot down and he knew it was coming. He knew it was probably coming. And that was okay with him because he was free. Because he didn't, not only did he not need approval the way so many of us, including me, crave approval, he didn't even need life. He would rather have truth. He would rather have truth than life. And that's it an example to you, to each of you, and to me. Make truth first. Everything else, there's a wonderful word for everything else. It's idolatry. Everything except truth is idolatry. We have so many idolatries, and every idolatry enslaves us. And there's only one thing that frees us, and that is truth. Now, I have a couple of suggestions about how to find it, but I have absolutely no idea what time it is. Uh, Anthony? <laughs> Was it five minutes? Or so? Okay. Uh, I, I will try to conclude with a little bit of advice about how to find it. You'll need a map. If you're just climbing Mount Fuji, or you're just trying to find your way to the rotunda, you wouldn't need a map. But remember, those are outward symbols. It's an inward journey. Those are just the, the outward symbols of it. You're going to need a map. And people are giving you maps all the time, which might be something you should be grateful for. And you need those people to give you maps early on in life when you don't know what to do. But if you want to be an adult, you're going to have to start refusing those maps. You're going to have to start saying, no, thank you. Because nobody knows your map but you have it, and the way to find it is to take an example from the seedling. I'm just gonna show you a cute picture of a seedling here. That seedling is growing. It's a little plant, it's just emerged from the ground, and yet un in an unconscious way, it already knows what its destiny is. It knows what it's gonna look like, because it has a map. You know what its map is? I think you do. It's in every single cell of, every, of the tissue of that plant. In the nucleus, there's the DNA. And that DNA has its map. And if that plant had ears and listened to people, it would come out all sorts of perverted ways that are not true to its map. But fortunately, it doesn't, because that's a human invention, this kind of thing. Humans invented something. Here is going to show a picture of uh, Alice in Wonderland, only not in Wonderland. This is the sequel, Alice 2, uh, Through the Looking Glass. And I had a wonderful little engraving of her climbing through the looking glass into that weird world, Through the Looking Glass. Now, in Lewis Carroll's version of Through the Looking Glass, the world's just topsy-turvy and strange. But I have a version of Through the Looking Glass, too. In my version, it actually looks just the same, except everything's backwards, right? In the, th in the looking glass world, 
appearance matters more than reality. In the looking glass world, the measure becomes the measured. In the looking glass world, if you want to be taller, you use shorter yardsticks. In the looking glass world, if you have something to do for a class, you ask the teacher what he wants, and he tells you. That's the looking glass world. In the looking glass world, if you want to do something, you ask for a checklist, and somebody gives you a checklist, and when you can check everything off, you've done it. In the looking glass world, everything's backwards. In the looking glass world, substance is real. Some substance is image, and image is substance. And it's a kind of prison that we live in, and I'm asking you to find your way back out of the looking glass. And people have done it, and they're examples to us. And you notice that these people, they don't follow rules. They follow rules in those realms of life that they're not masters of. Like, for example, if I cook, I better follow the recipe. I know that. Because other people wiser than I wrote it. But each of you has a gift, and it, you'll discover it at the mountaintop, and you'll get to the mountaintop from following that DNA by which you are one-tenth of one percent different from everybody else who's ever lived, because we're 99.9% .9 the same DNA, and that one-tenth of one percent is crucial. Because if you want to get somebody uh, somewhere, you know how to do it, Google Maps, right? You go to Google Maps, and it asks you two questions. It says, where do you want to go, right? So you type it in. If I typed in, let's say we all wanted to go to the Golden Gate Bridge, we type in Golden Gate Bridge. But then there's a second question. And that's, where are you now? Now, we could all have the same destination of Golden Gate Bridge, but that doesn't mean I can tell you how to get there, because there's that one-tenth of one percent of the journey that I don't know, right? Maybe Trevor lives on JPA, right? And maybe Kevin lives on Rugby Road. That means Trevor's map is not going to get Kevin started. And if Trevor, out of the generosity of his heart, tried to give Kevin his map, Trevor's map, the gesture might be well intended, but it's not going to help Kevin find the Golden Gate Bridge. So, um, yes, you'll need a map. And and that map is based on that one-tenth of one percent difference in you. And you won't find it as long as you're taking all of your guidance from outside of you. And you'll find it when you start listening to little intuitive signals that come from within you. I'd like to just give you one quick example of that. Uh, I came from a family that was sort of topsy-turvy. It was such that by the time I was um, eight years old, uh, both of my parents were gone, and I was living with people who we sort of came together to form a family that was kind of fabricated and worked in its own unique way. But I found and discovered that to help me deal with the stress of that transition, a little helpful story was told to me. And the little helpful story was, It's okay that you lost your family because it's where you are now that matters. And of course, the fact that that is half true made it very persuasive, and I believed it. But it was also half false because it also mattered where I came from. And when I was 30 years old, I came as an overwhelming intuition to me that that half of the story was not true and that that gave me a mountain to climb. And so, terrified, because the truth is scary, like Jefferson understood. Um, incidentally, that was a quotation I was supposed to show you. Jefferson said, here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate error, provided reason is allowed to refute it. And I wanted to quote that to you because people forget that truth is scary. 
because truth demands change, unlike fact accumulation. And so it was scary to have this intuition and realize I'd have to go and find these remainders of my family, and I found them, and I didn't trust my intuition until I walked into my mother's sister, sister's home in St. Louis. It was a woman I hadn't seen since I was a toddler. And when I knocked on the door, I still doubted that I had done the right thing. But when the door opened, I began to realize it was the right thing, and I was introduced to people who were waiting for me, as if they'd been waiting for 30 years for me to come back. And then I walked into the dining room, and the table was covered, covered with photographs. Photographs, I had never seen a photograph from my family from before, I'd never seen a picture of my mother when she was younger than 20, and there were baby pictures of her. And there was a picture of her holding me as a baby, and I had never seen any picture like that before. I was gonna show it to you, but I can't. But in any case, one of the reasons I thought to show it to you is that yesterday would have been her 76th birthday, and so uh, I thought of that. But the lesson is, when I finally started listening, let me just put it a different way, when I stopped listening to the friendly, well-intended stories, and started listening to the one-tenth of one percent in me that's uniquely me, then I was ready to climb the mountain, ready to be transformed, and ready to feel that kind of happiness that I'd felt as a four-year-old on the front step of my house with my toy boat again. And since that day, I have felt that happiness to some extent, I think, every day. Now, when you leave this building, if you go down the steps and you start walking that way, you'll be seeing a familiar building called Old Cabell Hall. Look at it a little more carefully than usual. You'll see columns, and you look up the top of the columns, there's a little architectural feature called a frieze. And in that frieze, you'll see Greek letters. And they're not for any fraternity or sorority. They say, if you translate them, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And you will face those words when you graduate. And let them set a standard for you. And let them be an appeal to you. Let them keep you from succumbing to the temptation always to be approved of by those whose approval you so urgently crave. And instead, let them let you choose truth and to seek truth and to climb mountains if that's what it takes to see it. And not just that but to come back down to the valley again with your discovery. For a discover you will, you can't help it. And when you bring it back down to terra firma and share it, you'll change the world. And don't get me wrong, some people are gonna laugh at what you have to share. Fred Rogers came down from the mountaintop and started saying things like, I like you just the way you are. And he'd say that to perfect strangers. And of course, the natural reaction is to laugh. Or to think, what a silly statement. Well, where are your standards, right? But of course, the standard was the highest possible standard. He's saying he likes you the way you are. And that's a challenge. We are the way we are until about age six when we start getting transformed into various things we're not. And that's a call to you to climb the mountaintop. He brought that down from his mountaintop, whatever his mountain was. Well, you go up yours, and you bring your discoveries back down, and they will change the world. And then one more thing. People helped you get started on that mountain. You owe them your thanks, surely. But the best way to thank them, after you've thanked them directly, is to help other people find their mountains. Because even right here on the grounds at university, there are all kinds of people who weren't as lucky to have this chance to get in that lifeboat that you were. And that's okay. You just help them find their way in too. Thank you. <laughs>